uh, I appreciate the kind introduction. I also appreciate you having me scheduled uh, just after Jim because I am, uh, no joke, going to try and get through 41 slides in the next 10 minutes. The only way to do that is without breathing, so I'm probably going to need some resuscitation uh, when I'm finished up here. Uh, when I got a, a phone call from Pat Hines a few months ago about coming and speaking here, um, those of you who have been on the receiving end of a Pat Hines phone call can sort of imagine this in your head. She actually asked me to come and speak uh, not about Virgin Galactic. After all, you've already heard from George Whitesides today, and uh, frankly, some of you in this room probably have my Virgin Galactic talk memorized by now. Uh, but instead, given the theme of this conference, to look back on my time uh, running space prizes, including doing so right here in southern New Mexico. Uh, and, and she sort of impressed upon me and helped me realize that I'm in a fairly unique position in that uh, I may be one of few, if not the only people in the world uh, who has really viewed incentive prizes from every angle. I've helped write them, I've helped run them, and now I work for a team that's commercializing the winning technology. Uh, so I thought I would look back on some of the prizes I'm most familiar with, with kind of a local focus here in New Mexico, since that's what makes sense, uh, and talk to you about some of the lessons that I have learned from, uh, from conducting those prizes here. Uh, I, I feel lucky in that I actually have a photograph of the very first moment in time when I, uh, when I first heard about incentive prizes, when they entered my life. Um, it was 1999. I was an undergraduate student. And uh, I was visiting Washington, D.C. and went to visit the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum and met up with this uh, group of, of individuals here, including uh, the guy in the middle there is Jerry Soffin, who is the chief scientist uh, for the Viking lander that we're standing in front of. And someone mentioned this thing that at the time was just called the X Prize. It would later become the Ansari X Prize. And it's funny because I, I very clearly remember having a great conversation about it. And at the end of the conversation, all of us deciding, well, that was fun. It's too bad no one's ever going to try and win. Uh, because that was certainly the consensus at the time. But, you know, I was a 19-year-old kid. I should have been young and idealistic, uh, and I wasn't. I thought it was a fun uh, thought exercise and that no one would ever compete, much less win. So it was fairly humbling when about six years later, uh, I was standing literally in the exact same spot uh, underneath the vehicle that had won that prize. Uh, and now representing the XPRIZE Foundation. It was one of my first lessons about prizes, was that every once in a while you're going to have to eat crow, and that's actually not such a bad thing if you're open to, to, uh, to uh, learning new things and, and having your mind changed um, in exciting ways. It was also, perhaps more importantly, a, a good way for me to recognize that what sounded like a silly idea to basically everything in the industry instantly becomes not a silly idea when very serious people like Burt Rattan, like Paul Allen, like Richard Branson, start to take it seriously. And that was a real eye-opener for me. Now, I would say I was eating crow. I had actually come around much earlier and, in fact, was working for uh, the XPRIZE Foundation as a volunteer in the final days of the Ansari XPRIZE. Uh, given where I work now and the fact that I worked at XPRIZE for about six years, everyone assumes that I was in Mojave for the prize-winning launches. But, in fact, I was uh, very concerned with a different set of space images around that time. Um, that was a year that, uh, that a lot of hurricanes hit uh, the state of Florida, and I'll give you one guess where all my family lives in the state of Florida. It's right at the intersection of three of those curves. So I actually didn't even have electricity. I didn't get to watch the flights live, much less make it out in person, even though I had, uh, had booked all my flights in advance and was supposed to be there on the flight line helping out uh, on the day of. It was another great prize uh, lesson. Sometimes you just have to embrace the chaos. Uh, you can never plan anything uh, perfectly. And, and those of you who are fans of live music, or professional sports, or just about anything else know that in chaos is where, where beauty happens. And in prizes, there is an awful lot of chaos uh, from time to time. But I did go on and get to work for the XPRIZE Foundation. I got to design several prizes. I got to run several of them, including one of them I want to spend most of the time talking about today, which was called the Lunar Lander Challenge. This was something we announced in, I believe, May of 2006 at the ISDC conference. And it was a prize for small private companies in the United States to essentially recreate the performance here on Earth of the kind of vehicle that could go from lunar orbit down to the lunar surface, refuel, and go back. This was shortly after then President Bush had announced that humans were returning to the moon, so lunar landers were particularly of interest. We announced this prize in May of 2006. Remember, the last vehicle of this class flown was the Delta Clipper in the 90s, and before that was the Apollo LEM in the 60s and 70s. Uh, so much to everyone's very pleasant surprise, we actually had a vehicle flying at the Las Cruces International Airport in October of 2006, five months later, uh, a team actually had a vehicle out there flying. It taught me that you should never underestimate the pace at which very small teams can work. Uh, they will really blow you away time and time again. But also, uh, it showed me that not everything is going to work out that way. Uh, Armadillo didn't have the, uh, didn't have the best day uh, out at Las Cruces, didn't win the prize money, which was great because 
they had jumped out to such a quick lead, everyone thought it was a foregone conclusion who was gonna win this prize. It was obviously Armadillo. Uh, so when they had a bad day, I was grateful that we had designed the prize in a way such that we wouldn't just incentivize one team if there was a lead horse, but because we had second place prizes and we had two different prize levels, we would be encouraging lots of different teams to compete. Because uh, the front runners don't always win, and you don't want your incentive prize to be dependent on the front runner winning. Um, so another year passes, Armadillo has a chance to go back and perfect what they had failed at doing, and they did it. They perfected it in practice many times at their home facility just outside of Dallas, Texas. They came back to the state of New Mexico, this time to the Holloman Air Force Base up in Mal Alamogordo, 45 minutes or so away from here, uh, having already done the job several times, and this time it didn't quite work out. For oh, I skipped one important thing. Oh, dang it. Oh, I'm so fast, so far behind schedule anyway. Uh, one thing I also really liked was the chance that because we were working with Northrop Grumman and with NASA, we had the chance to take in Armadillo and the other competing teams and give them a chance to look at the original Apollo lunar lander hardware. Now this is at a time where because commercial space was still such a new idea, everyone was positioning it as commercial space versus NASA. Some of you may remember the sign, Spaceship One, Government Zero. Uh, and a lot of people were saying these young upstarts, they don't, they're not respectful of the people who have gone before. You get a, a sense from this picture that these are kids in a candy store uh, looking at this vehicle. Nobody respects more what happened before than the people who are trying to recreate it now with the benefit of technology that's 40 years advanced and still having a really hard time of it. Uh, so I mentioned Armadillo had done it in practice perfectly many times. They come out to Al Alamogordo. Uh, and have a series of hard starts and another bad day and another year goes by without the prize winning again. It showed me that doing something in practice on your home court is very different than doing it in front of the judges when you're under the clock. And in the space business, we can't just do it on our home court. It's not about success on the test stand, although that's important. It's about success in the sky and in space and doing it on the clock when the judges are watching or the cameras are watching or the investors are watching or everyone else is watching. It's a pretty different ball game. Uh, another year passes. Armadillo does the job now many times in practice. They come back out to New Mexico again, and thankfully for them in 2008, the third time really was the charm. They win the level one prize, and that was exciting. But I was, in fact, even more excited by the fact that we had our second team ever compete. This was a two-person team called True Zero, uh, an electrical engineer and a mechanical engineer based out of the Chicago area. And I love this picture of this rocket because that's it. It is a tank, and it is a thrust chamber, and it is a few valves. This is like the platonic ideal of a rocket. Even something as complex as a rocket, right? We all use this cliche joke about it being rocket science. Even something as complex as a lunar lander can be reduced to its bare essentials. And when you do that, you can, like True Zero did, go from having never even thought about building a rocket in October of the previous year to flying it in front of an audience of, of thousands of people uh, the following year. We can do things simpler in this business if we're willing to, uh, to adjust our scope. Uh, now they flew it, they didn't win the prize. That was unfortunate for them, uh, although I note that both of them then received job offers from scale composites by virtue of having gone from nothing to flying in the matter of a few months. So good things come even out of the losing entries. Any of you who are competing for prizes or considering offering prizes, I encourage you to keep in mind, what do the teams who don't win do? How do they improve the industry uh, after that? Uh, Armadillo actually only won some of the prize money. They didn't win all the prize money. So we were then back again the next year, now 2009, fourth year of the prize. Armadillo, having done this thing so many damn times in practice, finally does the main job. They win the big cookie, uh, all the cookies at, the, uh, at their home facility this year in Cato Mills, Texas. Um, it was a picture-perfect flight. Well, I say that wasn't technically a picture-perfect flight. They had a small anomaly on one of the flights, and their vehicle, which normally landed dead center on pad every single time, actually landed about 11 half feet off pad, which is still really good, but in this prize, the competition, or the tiebreaker, rather, was landing accuracy. Armadillo had three more shots to try for a better landing accuracy. They said, you know what? We're so far out of everyone else. We don't need to. It's good enough. They found out later, sometimes good enough is not really good enough. Because a few weeks later, we were out in Mojave, California, uh, watching Mast and Space Systems, who you've heard from earlier today, fly their vehicle. Uh, they tried it in September, didn't do the job. They tried it again in October with a uh, junior varsity vehicle uh, and won the prize. And um, it goes to show that just because no one else has done the job right before the buzzer sounds, that's not the same as no one having done the job when the buzzer, buzzer sounds. Uh, these things can come down to the 11th hour, and sometimes, in fact, they do. Uh, I also really like that when we were out there watching those winning flights, uh, that was the day that, uh, that Mastin received all the parts to build their varsity-level vehicle. 
This is now October. They have to win the prize before the end of October. And thankfully for them, they displayed that in about three weeks, uh, a pile of parts can become a working prize-winning rocket, which was really exciting to see. Now, again, the rocket didn't work perfectly. They had some fires on the pad during their first attempt, but thankfully they got more than one attempt. Uh, so after burning out a lot of their wiring, uh, they discovered that you can come up with some creative solutions, and in fact, even a trash can lid can become part of a winning rocket, which is pretty spectacular and true, and I promise I'm almost done. 41 slides, I'm gonna do it really close. Uh, the thing I like most about that trash can lid is that the guy who came up with that trash can lid and installed that trash can lid did not work for Mastin Space Systems. He was in fact the leader of one of the other teams competing against Mastin Space Systems in that prize. Uh, and so here in the triumphant picture of Mastin having just won, you see not only Mastin employees, you see x -Corps employees, you see the team leaders of two of the other teams who volunteered to come on their own knowing they wouldn't win and wanting to see someone else win and helped out overnight as the Mastin team went and got their mandatory crew rest. Competition can bring out the best in people. Uh, the very end here, even that wasn't the end of the story because there was one other team that made a go, a team called Unreasonable Rocket. This was literally a father and son team had never done rockets uh, really at any serious level before competing in this prize. Um, when they first called us and said to register, I almost laughed them out of the building. But then I said, you know what, this is a prize. I, I, I don't have to pick them to win. I just have to say they deserve to compete. And they almost proved me wrong. In fact, I think if they had focused on just junior varsity or varsity, I think they would have won the whole thing. They spread themselves a little bit too thinly. Um, they tried both levels. Uh, didn't go well for them in either level. My big lesson from this was uh, thank God for tethers because I was in the blast radius of where that thing would have gone. But also the last thing I would say is sometimes it's the things that you're best at that really get you. Um, Paul Breed, the senior Paul Breed of that team was a software guy and what sunk that vehicle was software. Uh, if you leave something to the last minute forgetting that you can do it in your sleep, you'll probably do it in your sleep and we don't do things very well in our sleep. Um, so that's it, I'm a minute over. I hope you'll forgive me. Uh, this was fun, thank you very much.